Hello, everybody. Uh, I will let you all filter in. Please come down to the front row here. <laughs> I'd love to see you up, up front. Um, so this is, this is the really important message up front. So hopefully everybody's listening from the get-go. And that is what we all know, that climate change is the challenge of our lifetime. We need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. We need to cut emissions by half in less than 10 years. To give you some sense of perspective, emissions dropped by 7% in 2020 when we had a global pandemic and the entire global economy basically shut down. We need to do that same reduction amount year over year without shutting down the whole economy. So that's the scope of the challenge. Um, this panel will help us um, examine both the business opportunities and the policy accelerants to help achieve change faster, which is exactly what we need. I'm Elizabeth Sturkin, and I run our Net Zero program um, and business partnerships at Environmental Defense Fund. So. I truly loved reading, and I will tell you, I listened to Speed and Scale that John Doerr um, narrated. And um, I'm really honored to be with the team here, with Ryan Panchansaram and Anjali Grover of Speed and Scale. This book actually inspired a new season of the EDF Degrees podcast and Ryan's interviewed, um, which is all about what we need in terms of jobs of the future. I highly recommend the Degrees podcast. So Ryan is a co-author of Speed and Scale, advisor to ch the chairman at Kleiner Perkins, and the early investors of Amazon, Google, and of course, of course a, cl a host of climate-focused tech startups, formerly um, Deputy U.S. Chief Technology Officer under former President Barack Obama. Anjali Grover is Managing Director of Speed and Scale, and they are working to move leaders to act on the climate crisis. Anjali has also worked with CEOs and their teams to envision and activate bold futures. I am super excited to be here and interview you guys. So first, Ryan, yes. can you give this audience your elevator pitch about speed and scale and why everyone should pick up a copy of the book? Of course. So the quick elevator pitch on speed and scale is that it's an action plan, right? John and our team set out to say, well, if we could apply OKRs to the climate crisis, how many folks know what OKRs are first? <laughs> uh, good. OK, OKRs are objectives and key results, and we apply them to the biggest challenge of our time, which is to get to net zero by 2050. We spent time with over 100 experts around the world, whether they be policymakers, activists, founders, entrepreneurs, and came up with a plan. And we put that plan on a napkin uh, <laughs> because uh, simplicity was key. But it really came back to a question that we always had. How are we going to get there? What are the solutions and what are the accelerants? And so I'm gonna quickly go through these really fast to set the tone, and these are things that I think for a lot of us in the room, we really know, but to plan with speed and scale, we show how they all add up. We've gotta electrify transportation. We've gotta decarbonize the grid, right? Getting rid of coal and gas. We've gotta fix food, everything from eating less beef to wasting less to composting. We've gotta protect nature, quite simply ending deforestation. We have to clean up, yes, we have to clean up industry steel, concrete, plastics. And then no matter which model you look at, we're still left over with five to 10 gigatons a year. And so we have to figure out ways to remove carbon using nature-based mechanisms or engineered ones. And so this is how we go from 59 to zero, but we've got to do it quickly. And so there are a set of accelerants that we in this room can pull on. We can win the policy and politics, right? Taking commitments and actually turning it into legislation. We can turn movements into action, voting for candidates that care about the climate, but also making great corporate commitments that meet the net zero goal or goal earlier. We've got to innovate, which is driving down the cost of clean energy technologies, and we have to invest. And these accelerants, we can pull on them. They're all equal to one another, because when one is failing, you can just try to accelerate the other three. Behind each of these objectives are a set of measurable key results, 
And these posters that we have out in the back, but also online at speedandscale.com, you can see what measures we need to move. And that was really critical here. What are the measures that matter? Where are the gigatons? Where do we need to put our collective action? So for example, in KR1, sorry, in objective one, we've got to make sure the cost of electric vehicles are price parity to their fossil fuel equivalent. We've got to make sure the miles driven are electric, right? These are key important things. We've got KRs around movements. There's one called 8.3 that Ange will dig into in a little bit later. And um, just showing here, I realize it's kind of scattered on the screen, but if you go to speedandscale.com, we've got all of these KRs where you can actually click into them, see the data, rank them by the things that we're in trouble on, the code red, which you see here, but also things where there's actually optimism around the corner. So that's the quick pitch. Optimism, yes. So Anjali, since the book came out, what does the broader speed and scale initiative look like? Yeah, what are you so, working on? So we spent about two years investing in building this plan, this roadmap. And, and the great thing about it is that it gave us a really clear sense of what to go do now. Where, where yeah. do we most need to focus? We are kind of governed by this idea that we've got to go for the gigatons. There's a lot of important work that's being done. We don't have a lot of time on our hands right now. And so to really go through and, and be able to score each of these key results and to understand their relative gigaton impact has been hugely important for us and helping us understand how we should spend our time and our resources. Yeah. So our work is largely focused around, as you mentioned, um, help moving leaders to act on the climate crisis with greater urgency and ambition. And the way that's translating for us now is to really find, fund, and accelerate solutions to the climate crisis. So that's the work that we're, we're engaged in right now. We launched this tracker, as, as you can see on the screen, in June. Um, and you can, as Ryan mentioned, you can go on and sort of see for yourself, where, where are we lagging? Where are we leading? Um, unfortunately, there's more areas right now where we're lagging than leading, probably not a surprise to most people here. But the tide is starting to change. And I think that we're getting a really keen sense of where we collectively need to focus in order to hit that 50% reduction mark by the end of the decade and then get all the way to zero by 2050. Okay, thanks. So Ryan, the Inflation Reduction Act just yes. passed. Yay! Yay. So, <laughs> finally. I'm gonna leave this slide uh, up, yeah. So um, where should companies and investors focus now that that new law has passed? Yeah, um, incredibly surprising win. Right? I think for all of us in the climate community, a month and a half ago, didn't expect any movement of this scale or magnitude on the policy front. But to answer your question, to think about it, we actually have three pieces of policy that as investors and companies we can lean on. Right? You have the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, you have the Chips and Science Act, and then you have IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law really set a neat foundation, right? reinvesting in the country, investing in deployment, projects and, and, and really yep. setting that foundation. The CHIPS Act, while very focused on semiconductors, also included a good amount of money towards R&D for clean technologies. And so that's creating companies that we can invest in in the future, right? Investing in R&D, we do the venture capital piece. IRA really pushes the, I would call, pulls the lever on the markets, right? Putting tax credits in place that are really around generation of energy, around carbon removal, as well as encouraging things like heat pumps and energy efficiency to be really deployed. And so what it does for an investor is it creates that certainty that we need, right? So now when an, uh, a company is pitching that, you know, we hope the regulatory markets, or we hope certain things are gonna happen, they can actually point to legislation and say, actually there's money already allocated or there's something in the tax code. But I think it also gives a lot of us some hope as well too that there's more appetite to do more things. Because I think for folks working in deeper technologies are more on the fringe, we still need policy changes there. Yep. So, so <laughs> clearly the scale of this challenge is massive and companies need to do a lot in short order. Um, so I guess my question to you, Anjali, is I know that your team at Speed and Scale is looking at how companies are doing on this challenge. Can you um, say what you're finding? Yeah, sure, it, it's been um, hugely insightful and there's incredible work that our team is leading and, and really where we started, which is, is around KR 8.3, which is under our movements objective and it's 100% of Fortune Global 500 companies commit immediately to reach net zero by 2040. And so we said, okay, you know, the tracker is really intended to sort of pick up where the book left off and show what progress are we making against these key results. 
And so we started by looking through the data, the publicly available data um, that's out there on corporate climate commitments. And it was pretty surprising. What we found is about less than 2% of the Fortune Global 500 have clear and effective net zero commitments in place today. That, that's tiny, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you have to contrast that against, I think, a figure that is more often cited uh, in the media, which is that 50% of Fortune Global 500 have a climate commitment. There's a really big difference, right, between having a climate commitment and having the right climate commitment, because ultimately yeah. in 2050, no one's gonna care if we had a bunch of sort of loose climate commitments in place. And you know, you might look at that number and feel dismayed, but I think that what we're also finding is that there are a handful of leaders out there that are doing really, really incredible work to decarbonize. You know, Alphabet uh, recently said that they are gonna be carbon free by 2030, moving from carbon neutral. We're seeing a lot of great commitments out of other companies, Deutsche Telekom and Unilever, to name a few. Um, and I, I think really the, the question here is how do we encourage companies to go faster and to do more? Uh, I think in having conversations, now we're in this validation phase, we're learning a lot about the apprehension and the concern that some of these companies have around disclosing the work that they're doing out of fear of retribution or, or you know, the public saying it's not enough. Um, and sure, it's not enough, but, but we've got to start somewhere. And in the absence, especially here in the United States, of regu regulation that is going to force companies to do the right thing, we're essentially relying on the goodwill of corporations, of the private sector, to make these commitments and then to act on them. And, and so I think we've got to do a better job of, of telling the story, of shifting the narrative to really hold up the companies that are doing exceptional work in this space um, and, and um, so that we can get others to, to yep. join on board. 2%, yep. we're at 2%. We have so much uh, further to go in this space. Yeah, and one thing we're going to do is this tracker that we have right now. We're just sharing the top level numbers, but we hope to by COP to actually share that level by company by company detail. And it's things like what scopes are you covering when you say greenhouse gases or you're going to get carbon neutral? Do you mean all GHGs? It means that when you talk about getting to zero, that you're leaning on removal, not avoidance and efficiency offsets. And so we're going through this exercise right now, and we can't wait to share it in a few months. That sounds great. And, um, yeah. I wanted to. Uh, oh yeah, if you keep it going, the, uh, the other way. Yeah, the other I, way. I, went, I went back. The front, the back. <laughs> quick, quick recap of everything here. Um, so go. I wanted to make a mention that we, uh, you know, the, the fact is we do know what companies um, need to prioritize right now, and I wanted to point to this piece of work that EDF did with Deloitte. Uh, Pathways to Net Zero. It's a series of analysis that really focuses on what we need to do in this decisive decade and provides that kind of a clear roadmap. And I wanted to encourage folks to take, take a look at that. Um, so um, I think that uh, I'd love to hear a little bit um, from you both about what you're most excited about when you're looking uh, down the road, right? In a year, in five years, in ten years, um, we have so much to do in this decade. So, what are, what are you seeing? What are you excited about? What are you optimistic about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, the the tonality in the moment that we're in right now, and talking to others, has completely shifted in the last month and a half, especially domestically. And so, in one year's time, looking at how the three hundred sixty nine billion dollars have flowed through this system and seeing those technologies move down the cost curve so that we can encourage greater uptick, again, not just here but abroad, that is a hugely important step that we need to take. And I think to see those dollars in action, we've got John Podesta at the helm now, um, is gonna be a really, um, really awesome thing to look out for in the very near term. Yep, that, that, that is exciting. John, John will be great in that position. Ryan, what about you? <laughs> I'll pick on the, so that was in the year's time, I'll pick the five years time. Okay, it, you know, that bucket, if you think five years ago, Yes. You know, five years ago, solar wind wasn't cheap yet. And I think about the folks that have been a part of this climate movement for the past 20, 30 plus years saying there will be a moment when that happens. And that happened five years ago. Five years from now, you're going to see things like all categories of EVs actually become cheaper. You're going to see solar and wind plus storage become cheaper than fossil fuel equivalent, right? This is like what you're going to see in these five years, this shift. And when the green premium, right? when it's more expensive than the alternative becomes that discount. Yeah. 
market forces can take yep. over. Like that's, that, like, that's what excites me about the next five years. Yep, that sounds good. Ten. Ooh, ten. ten is, I mean, we don't know what the future holds, right? And I think that it would have been impossible 25 or 30 years ago to know, to, excuse me, 30 years ago to know exactly what the internet would yield. And I think we're kind of in a moment like that for climate. What are the technologies that we are not anticipating or that we're not anticipating being widely available at cost um, that are going to change the game entirely? And so I think that the breaking of the model is what I'm really looking forward to. Like, what is that thing going to be? Um, is sort of the thing that keeps me on the edge of my seat. Yep. The thing that gives me hope for the 10 years is a bit of the, the presentation that Sophie and Kim shared where you have the pace of investment this year still, right? The number of deals is still on track. The dollars may not be there, but the companies are there. And so in the 10 years that we're going to see going forward, these small startups at the seed and series age stages will be big and incredible things there. Then. Yeah, I, I would say, um, to, to throw my two cents in that the thing that give, gives me the most optimism um, is is just my kids. You know, they're going to be the next generation of leadership. And I think about um, EDF has a climate core program that puts students into companies, and now they're all over in, in business. And I think the same thing's going to happen with this next generation. Absolutely. <clears throat> they're going to take over, and they're going to demand nothing less than a win for the environment in addition to a win for business. There is no other path forward for them. Yeah. So that's helpful. Uh, so everyone's really excited about the, a lot of the new technologies, carbon cap capture and storage, and all, all, all of these um, sexy new, new technologies, which we really need. Um, but you know, it remained to be proven out. So what, what are you seeing in terms of um, this space and climate in tech investment and like how are you all thinking about that at this point? For right now, I mean, it's investing in two categories, the now and the new, right? There's a lot of money going after scaling the technologies that have been already invented but need yep. to be out there yep. at the you know, gigaton scale. The, on the new side, I mean, we're seeing new forms of energy being invested in like fusion and geothermal and others. You're seeing great new companies in the carbon removal space. You're seeing like, I think that's actually kind of the, the boundless number of categories uh, that engineers and policymakers and others are going after is quite exciting. I mean, I, it's like it's almost like I keep pointing back to that the chart that was shared, but you see where the dollars are flowing, and it's inspiring to see venture capitalists picking up these R and D projects and putting money behind them to create companies. You know, I, I think what's what's really exciting too is not just the tech solutions, but the sort of broad array of solutions. You know, we're seeing California out in front right now. That has huge implications, not just for the state of California, but for the country as a whole and the world is the fifth largest economy in the world. And so when California says we're phasing out fossil fuel vehicles, we're putting $54 billion into climate tech and advancing it in short order, um, there's a market signal that's sent out there. And I think we're um, you know, we're very conscious about not having a sort of overly technocentric view of the transition and what is needed here. And I think we're going to see solutions from a lot of different domains that are going to sort of move the needle forward, uh, move us forward. Um, you know, and, and that I think is, is really exciting. I will say on the tech front, you know, I, I look at the allocation of IRA and C, $2.6 billion allocated towards protecting nature, essentially. And that's, a, in the grand scheme of IRA dollars, is a, is a pretty small amount. But I think that we're starting to see more interest and appetite from the private sector in developing technologies that will help us better understand the sources of the problem um, and hopefully equip us and generally raise the consciousness around wanting to invest in an area that I think people sort of don't know what to do with right now. It's like we, we all agree that we need to protect nature, our, our oceans, our lands, our forests. Um, but we haven't, as Sophie and and Kim shared, we haven't quite figured out how to move the capital to doing exactly that. Well, um, thank you both. A Speed and Scale is a super compelling book and an excellent plan. So um, everybody should make sure to pick up your copy. How do they do that? <laughs> oh, well, there are posters here, which have yes. the whole, but you can also just go to speedandscale.com. I think the intention is, how do we move us towards the collective actions we need to do, right? The policies that need to yep. be created. Yep. If we're employees within a company, how do we get them to set the commitments we want them to? And so we're here as a resource, but really to also learn from everyone as well. Um, Please join me in thanking Anjali thank Grover and Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.